Happy Sabbath, everyone, and welcome. Welcome visitors, welcome to those watching online. The Word of God tells us, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Let us bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and let us not forget all his benefits. Have you been blessed this week with the Lord's benefits? Have you experienced his forgiveness, his provision and care? Let us lift up our voice in praise. Just want to make a few announcements here. All guests and members are invited to join us in the fellowship hall today for a potluck right after the second service, right outside the sanctuary doors to the left, down the corridor and to the left into the family center. There is no Jesus on Prophecy seminar tonight, friends, and no Jesus on Prophecy meetings this coming week. Next Sabbath, we will have a continuation of the prophetic theme, though, for church service and in the evening at 645. Also, prayer meeting will begin this Wednesday at 6.30 to 7.30, and we will be going through the study, a study on the prophecies of Daniel. You don't want to miss out on that. We're going to continue our digging deep into the Word of God and understanding clearly not only the message, but how to share the message, friends. Tomorrow is the inf uh, information meeting for all those interested in the 2020 El Salvador mission trip. So if you have any interest at all, please come. And we will meet in the fellowship hall at 9.30 tomorrow morning so that we may learn more. This is for village church leaders. Please note, Monday night is our monthly leadership team meeting. So make sure you take a, enter that into your calendar and be there Monday night, leadership team meeting. Also, please note there will be a blood drive here on Thursday this coming week. All blood types are needed and welcomed. Uh, there has been a special call in Michigan for O negative. So if you have O negative, that would be a great blessing. Come out and donate some of that. Uh, this blood goes to our area hospitals to help people with trauma cases, such as those in car accidents. And I praise God I didn't need blood in my accident last week, but had I needed it, I'd have been thankful if it was there. So let us keep that in mind. People in accidents, mothers who lose too much blood in childbirth, cancer patients, and so on. So let us come out and support that ministry. Uh, please consider donating this coming Thursday. Uh, there is an insert in your bulletin that does list the URL where you can go and schedule your appointment. Also, uh, coming up, friends, it won't be too long, our Daniel 11 conference is uh, coming soon, October 17th through the 19th. Also, Christmas Behind Bars, Bagging Day, that's coming up where we will put together those packages November 10th. I want to thank everybody. That was a great response. If you haven't signed up, uh, we're just about to our, our maximum number, but uh, if you really want to come, just come and see, you can still sign up. I'll, I'll accept a few more people, I'm all right with that. We want to make sure we get all our youth in. Uh, they're really excited about doing this. So thank you for the, the overwhelming response to that. Some sad news, friends. Uh, Nancy McCall passed away this last Monday. Uh, many of you know she was struggling with battling with cancer and uh, she fought a good fight i tell you um, god blessed her she had a very beautiful encounter with christ and i do believe god brought her back to this church for that particular encounter thank you for all those that rallied and ministered to her and uh, there will be a memorial service scheduled here sometime soon please keep the family in special prayer especially her daughter mary also, Marilyn Dry also passed away this week on Tuesday. A memorial service will be held uh, on Sabbath, October 26th, 3 p.m. here at the church. So if you want to put that in your calendar as well. Friends, God has a special message for us today. I do not doubt one bit that he's going to speak to us individually and as a body. So let us prepare our hearts to hear what he has to say. God bless.
I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell all of your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day um, when we can come and rest from all our work and spend time with you and study and other friends and family and fellow Christians. Um, please bless our time here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. It's a beautiful Sabbath morning. I want to welcome you all here. And now it's time for our children's story. So young people, there's baskets in the back. Let's worship the Lord and think about how to trust in Jesus.
Good morning to everyone. On this cool, crisp fall day, we've got fall here now. That's nice. All right, how many have ever been around a big dog? Like one that looks you in the eye. You're all about that size, where if you got by a big German shepherd, you could be very afraid. Well, I want to tell you, years ago, there were two countries in Europe, and they didn't like each other. And they were fighting. And really, it was over religion, which makes the worst fights. And what happened was, was that some people from the one country killed the mommy and daddy of a little girl. And they were so hard-hearted. They looked at the little girl and they said, will you give up Jesus? And she looked back at them and said, I love Jesus. And they said, if you don't give up Jesus, we're going to throw you in the pen with all the hungry, savage dogs. So are you going to give up Jesus? She said, I love Jesus. And those big, strong men didn't care that it was a little bitty girl. They grabbed her by the arms. They threw her over the fence, and they walked away. The next morning, they came back, and one of them looked over the fence, and they looked down to that end, and they went like that. There was a big dog in there. And there was a little girl on her knees praying. And every time one of those dogs at the other end of the pen tried to come down by her, he smiled at them. You know, have you ever seen that when they show their teeth? It's not good, unless it was good this time. And he snarled. And those two men said, there really is a God. Now what if she wouldn't have trusted Jesus? The angel was sent to shut the mouths of the lion. And the angel was sent to keep the savage dogs away. And you know what? Jesus can take care of his own. He does, and he will. So let's remember the angel of the Lord's around us. And he, he takes good care of us. And if sometimes we're called to suffer for Jesus, he'll be with us then too. But remember, Jesus said, don't be afraid. I'll never leave you or forsake you. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the stories of faith, little children leading us. May we follow in simplicity and trust. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can go back to your seats now. As you'll see in the bulletin, the offering today is for combined budget. And if you look on the back of your tithe envelope that's in the pew, you'll see some of the projects and activities that that offering goes towards. I want to thank you for your generous support of the combined budget this year, and we ask that you continue cheerfully giving um, and following God's example in cheerfully giving to help others. We can see in Hebrews 10:14 that for one offering he hath perfected ever them that are sanctified. Christ is our, an offering for us to help us and let us give cheerfully to help others learn of the gospel. Would the deacons come forward at this time?
Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for willingly giving your Son as an offering for us. And Lord, we are returning a portion to you. May you bless this to reach others for, the God, for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite the least of these ministries to come up and give us an update on how the project's going. Hi, happy Sabbath, church members. My name is Joshan. And I'm Madison. We are here representing least of these ministries, and we are here primarily for thank you guys for all your support. The support that Village Church provided to us enable us to make more than 1,200 bags for homeless in Chicago. And for that, we are thankful for you guys. Also, all the donations of blankets and quilts were so large that we, we ran out of physical space for store them. We are so are thankful for that. <laughs> and we want to reassure you guys and keep, keep us for you, keep donating for that ministry that brings a little, a little bit of warmth for the homeless of Chicago. So if you, if you can continually support that ministry financially or donating things or donating your time, we much appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving us that update. Can I just ask, how often do you go to Chicago throughout the semesters? Just so that it runs away. Uh, this semester we are going once a month. Uh, if someone wants to join us, the next time we are going is October 26th. So you guys are welcome to join us. We usually live in Sabbaths 2 to 1.30. Uh, in November we are going in day 16. So our church members are invited to join us and see by themselves like what God can do in that person's life. That they, they feel so empty in the street and when someone stops and talks and smiles for them, it's a difference in their day. So you guys can also experience that. Thank you. Thank you. 1,200 people, quite a large number. Thank That's you. good, thank you. Okay. Okay, our scripture reading this morning is found in Luke 18, verses 18 to 30. Um, it's Luke 18, verses 18 to 30. Um, now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, You do well to call me good. No, no, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. And so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, and he, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that, he became very sorrowful. He said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, How then can we, can, who then can be saved? But he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, See, we have left all and followed you. So he said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children 
for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. It's now come time for us to pray. Uh, as many as are able, let us kneel. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we just want to thank you so much for the wonderful week, the wonderful day that we have, your many, many blessings which you continually pour out over our lives, Lord. There are so many we cannot even count them all. Your love towards us is truly great and we come before you to ask for forgiveness, that you would day by day transform us and make us more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you so much for the example which he gave us for, for inspiring the prophets to write scripture that we may have a record of how you have acted in the past and how you will act in our lives presently and in our future lives. Father, we come before you to lift up those who are sick, who are in pain, those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. I pray that you would be with each and every one of them, that you would supply the need which each person needs to know that you love and care for them and that you are calling them to a deeper and more intimate relationship with you. Father, I pray that you would help us to trust you more, that we would not get distracted by the things in this world which it seems as though Satan is perfecting new and new ways in which to distract, divert, and tempt us. Help us to always have our eyes fixed on you and on heavenly things. Help us always to keep the goal before us and keep that end in mind as we do our daily duties. May everything that we do be preparing us for that life to come. Please be with us, Lord. Help us to be good ambassadors for your kingdom wherever we are, whether it's here at church, whether it be in our homes or our workplaces. May we constantly seek to lift you up higher and higher, and may many see your face. I pray, Lord, in a special way that you would be with Pastor Kelly as he opens up your word this morning. May you give him the words that you would have him to speak. May your spirit touch our hearts and our minds and help us always to have a heart that is soft and willing to always turn to you and not a heart of stone. Help us not to be stiff-necked as the children of Israel were many times over, but help us to turn to you every time we need help, Lord, for you alone are able to deliver and to save. And we know this. We pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to be singing a song today called Meet Me There, and it's an invitation to one day all be together on that heavenly, beautiful shore, and as you listen to the words describing that beautiful place that one day we're invited to go to, and the first boy, uh, the, the last verse says, where the songs of heaven ring and the blessed forever sing in the palace of a king, meet me there where in sweet communion blend heart to heart and friend with friend in a world that ne'er shall end, meet me there. And I pray that each one of you will meet, meet me there. I wanna be there too. Let's all go together there someday. Where the faithful part no more 
When the storms of life are, meet me there. Where the night dissolves away into pure and perfect day, I am going there to stay. Meet me there. Meet me One day I'm going home, meet me there. Hear me struggle in the race, trusting God's unfailing grace. But one day I'll see his face, meet me there. for that beautiful invitation. How many of you want to go? Amen. Amen. All right, folks. We are together in the presence of the Lord. We're going to take one last lap around this track on Jesus on Prophecy. We're transitioning on Wednesday to Unsealing Daniel. It'll be a 60-minute program, a little bit different. Bring your friends. Invite people to watch. Let's have a stronger Wednesday night service than we've ever had before. And then next Sabbath, uh, we'll continue in the morning and the evening with Jesus on Prophecy, same format as what we've had for the last two weeks. So in the morning, we'll have a prophetic sermon. In the evening, we'll have a prophetic sermon. And then the next weekend after that, we will be anticipating digging deeper into the book of Daniel in Daniel 11 Symposium. There's a lot there, and uh, we hope to have some materials for you to come prepared ahead of time to see a little bit about what it's about. Let's pray. Lord, our lives are in your hands. We do want to meet you there. I pray, Lord, that in this message shared and received in this house of worship and shared and received over the Internet, that you would do what you would to retune our hearts and refocus our lives about not only being there ourselves, but giving others the invitation to meet us there. So now bless us as we go. We set a watch before my lips and a guard before the door of my mouth. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm holding in my hands a baptismal certificate. This certificate has 13 points. They're summaries of what we believe. All through the years when I'm ready to follow the leading of the Spirit in someone's discipleship journey and they have laid a foundation in studying the Bible and they're ready to make a proclamation of Christ, I invite them up here and I read through this certificate. Now, I'm not going to read through all of it now. It touches on the nature of God, the inspiration of the Scriptures, the soon coming of Jesus, how we treat our bodies, what we do with our money, God's money. And we get all the way down to the very last bullet point, and this is what it says. I accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy and that people of every nation, race, language are invited and accepted into its fellowship and I desire to be a member of this local congregation of the world church. I can remember the day, not like the date, but I remember the encounter when a influential person in my congregation came to me and said, I really don't think you should read that last one. They were a doctor, my age, and they felt like the reading of that statement could leave the wrong impression and make somebody who was not of the Seventh-day Adventist church uncomfortable maybe even offended. And so they asked me when we were doing baptismal candidate affirmations if I would leave number 13 off. And for a little while I did. I mean, I didn't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable in the audience. I mean, isn't the, the real ministry of Jesus to make everyone comfortable? And I didn't want anybody that brought somebody to church that wasn't a member of our faith to be embarrassed that maybe there was some pastoral arrogance or, or maybe some ecclesiastical arrogance or maybe some Adventist arrogance going on. And so I didn't read number 13 for a while. I accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. And then after a while... I got over it and I said I'm gonna read number 13 because I believe number 13 Jesus said don't think I came to bring peace but I came to bring a what a sword and to set it not a mother and a daughter-in-law members of the same family. Why? Because some would hear the prophetic voice in Scripture. Some would respond to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And some would not. Some would move on the narrow journey. And some would continue with the masses in the other direction. Now this morning, I'm going to lay a pretty big challenge on everyone who hears this message. The first thing I want to do is I want to tell you absolutely, wholeheartedly, beyond the shadow of the doubt, that I believe from the days of Huss and Jerome and Wycliffe and Tyndale and Luther and Calvin and all these great Bible students and Bible preachers, I believe that God has been rebuilding His church and His goal is to get it into apostolic readiness and unity and pour out spirit on them because the final battle is going to be one in which He wants to be able to work beautifully and freely through His church. And I believe in the early 1800s when the Millerite movement was in full swing, God understood there'd be a shaking and then out of the shaking, there'd come a purified group of people who knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Spirit 
of God was in the movement, even though the movement made a colossal theological blunder. It wasn't the first theological blunder, and it won't be the last. But beyond the blunder was the experience with God. Beyond the blunder was lots of solid Bible study. And I believe coming out of that movement was the rediscovery of several very essential truths about God. The first of which being is that God doesn't damn people in an eternal torturing chamber for the pleasure of the saved or for himself or for anyone else. When you die, you're dead. Two truths very closely related to each other. Coming out of that movement was an ongoing Bible study in which they discovered that the Sabbath was not only not changed, but the same God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever is the one who wants an appointment with us and will celebrate it with us in heaven. Yes, the seventh-day Sabbath came out of that movement in its early days as well. And then beyond that, the great truths about Christ, not only as sacrifice on the cross, the story doesn't end there. Jesus opening up a transformational relationship in the role as the God-man in the presence of God for the men and women on earth. So we have a sanctifying relationship where the power of the cross is actually transforming our lives and we're becoming exceedingly joyful through the exceeding precious promises whereby we become partakers of the divine nature. That ministry in the holy place was to be followed by an amazing moment when Christ would start declaring our names before the angels. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. Before the angels, he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Confessed by who? By Christ. As he's going through the books, showing that his work in our lives is coming to or has come already depending upon whether they are saints resting in the grave or saints living. His work is sufficient. His work is complete. His work is perfect. And when he comes out of the most holy place, he's coming out to save us and to end this dark night of woe. Yes, the doctrine of the sanctuary also came out of this era. And one more, and that is there would be a resurrection of the voice of prophecy. Now, when we go to looking at the Scriptures this morning, turn there, if you would, to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. When we go to looking at the Scriptures, we find a dual qualifier for how God's people will be recognized at the end of time. The dragon's got his attention on one group. He's conquered the rest or compromised them, but the group that's left, he's going to take them out. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. God's been defending his people. He opens up the earth and he swallows the waters and there's a new nation that comes out, the United States of America. Lamb-like in the beginning, beast-like in the end. But before it's all said and done, the dragon re reconstitutes itself. It receives a deadly wound and it's healed. And when it's in its full strength, it's got one goal, and that's to take out the pure woman. And that pure woman, which represents a pure church, is represented with two qualifications. It says in verse 17, so the dragon was enraged with the woman. I don't know if you've had somebody enraged with you before, but it's a scary moment. And went off to make war with the rest of her children. That would be those that are left. We would call that a remnant who keep the commandments of God. They're not going to deviate. It's not nine out of ten. It's ten out of ten through the indwelling power of Christ. It's not just in precept, it's in principle, and it's in spirit. It's in spirit and in truth. They keep the commandments of God, and they hold, they hold to the testimony of Jesus. They're hanging on. Flip over to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. Let's make sure we let the Bible define its terms. They, they are keeping the commandments of God, and they are holding on to this testimony. It says, then I fell at his feet to worship him, John and the angel. And the angel says, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours. What a beautiful statement. <laughs> and we're fellow servants with the angels here today and of your brethren, the rest of the church, who hold 
the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the what, friends? I'm afraid I can't hear you. It is the what, friends? Thank you. I know after 12 nights out, you're all a little bit tired. But I'm planning to finish strong on the last lap around the track. Amen? Listen, friends, the spirit of prophecy. It's not just that there's a set of books that we've learned to term with that phraseology. It's not just that there's testimonies and the conflict of the ages and the conflict beautiful. It's not just that there's commentary and devotion. It's that the very spirit of the prophets is still enshrined and retained and valued in the midst of this communion. It's absolutely imperative this morning that we do a little bit of serious reflection about this because I'm fearful that the gospel train that is being powered by the Protestant Reformation engines, one of which I believe undoubtedly is the Adventist church. And the Adventist church, by the way, entrusted with at least five distinct recovered apostolic doctrines. It has to be an engine that is fueled, fueled by the Spirit, but fueled also by the practicality of our love, devotion, prayers, money, time, attention, talents, all shared to make sure it goes. I'm here to tell you, I've never seen a train belch and sputter and coast. I've been in cars that have run out of gas, but never trains. But I do know this, when you've got a bunch of freight cars behind you and they're full of precious ore, in this case, the material of Scripture, the gold of truth, it can coast for a long ways before you figure out that it's no longer being pulled. It's just running on the inertia. You know inertia, the force that carries something in the direction it was already going? I'm here to tell you, friends, we proclaim that we have the testimony of Jesus and we keep the commandments of God. But I wonder how precious and how active and how primary that testimony is. You're all here today, so you're not stumbling over the commandment that the rest of Christianity is stumbling over. Somehow the idea of being God with, the, with God for a day is just a big downer. No, you've decided that resting as he said and resting in him, in Christ, that rest of the book of Hebrews is something that matters to you. So you're all here. So it appears that we're at least good on holiness on the day, at least for these few hours we're together. But when it comes to the spirit of prophecy, when it comes to the power of the prophet to teach rightly, exhort powerfully, and comfort gently, do we embrace all of these things? Or have we subtly conformed to the message and the culture and the spirit of the age? This is a question worth asking. Because there are things that are unread that leaves our lives unchanged unchallenged and unconvicted and it makes the life of every faithful preacher and elder and deacon and parent and teacher that much harder and some in ignorance are failing to fulfill their God-given responsibilities letting go of those things that trifle and embracing those things that are a treasure yes there are some who don't understand and they've abdicated their responsibility because they have not taken advantage of the prophetic voice which is the extra light in the midst of a deeper darkness. So I'm asking you at the beginning of this message, are these things educating and guiding and lighting your journey? Of course, the Scripture being the primary light, the Word of God. But when Jesus knew how dark it was going to get, how earnestly the devil would work, he'd say, look, some of the principles and applications in the Word I'm going to accentuate and I'm going to empower with a greater illumination. And I'm going to do it by spelling it out a little bit more clearly for you. What does it mean if you have the advantage of the winning gift, but it never is a package that's unwrapped or opened? Why should the pastor have to stand up here and say all the things that you ought to be reading in your own home, and instead of being frustrated with a spiritual announcement, you should be praising the Lord that the trumpet is giving a certain sound, and actually there should be an orchestra 
finely tuned because these sentiments and principles are what are directing in the homes and the lives of the congregation. Yes, I'm here today to suggest that it might be that the Adventist church has a problem. And it might be that the spirit of prophecy is no longer really a valued gift, or we could say a significant contributor, an identifying characteristic of us as a people. And then I want to ask you, should we call into question our status at any level of really being the remnant? It's a serious question. And I'm not here to say the church has apostatized. What I am here to say is that it's easy to drift. It's easy to be conformed to the world, which is what Paul said in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Don't be conformed to the world. But our lives drift. And there's nobody in the world today to to utter a prophetic voice, to ever say anything that makes you feel bad. As a matter of fact, as we all find our personal journeys to God and to the truth, the one thing nobody should ever do is tell you your journey's not the way. It's a serious consideration. And since I've pastored in this denomination for about 30 years, and since I've sat on almost all committee levels through this denomination, and since I've got kind of a long look as someone who wasn't raised as a Seventh-day Adventist, and God led me into this amazing message and movement, It might be appropriate for me this morning on the last morning of a series called Jesus on Prophecy to remember that Jesus as a prophet did a whole lot more than make everybody feel good. In this series, I quoted James Dobson, whose father used to say, I'd rather tell the truth that hurts than heals than a falsehood that comforts and then kills. Indeed, this is the modus operandi of Jesus, a pure heart loving a people that he wants to make pure. A few years back, a man by the name of David Platt wrote a book called Radical. Radical. I want to tell you a little bit about why he wrote the book. He wrote the book because in his ministry, Baptist pastor, I believe, in his ministry, he found himself going around the world dealing with places where he would describe them as the secret church. In other words, they had to meet in homes. And they couldn't have the privilege because of governmental forbadance that meeting was not allowed. And so they'd meet in homes and they'd study and pray deep into the night. He called them secret churches. And then he'd come back to his American church. On the eve of going to his American church, he had just been to India. He had stood up on a tall hill outside of Hyderabad. And he had been reflecting on this one thing. He says to himself in the book, I stood up on a mountain at the heart of Hyderabad, India. The high point in the city housed a temple for Hindu gods. I smelled the offering that had been given to the wooden gods behind me. I saw teeming masses in front of me. Every direction I turned, I glimpsed an urban center filled with millions upon millions of people. And then it hit me. The overwhelming majority of these people had never even heard the gospel. They offer religious sacrifices day in and day out because no one has told them that in Christ a final sacrifice has already been offered on their behalf. And as a result, they live without Christ and if nothing changes, they will die without Him as well. As I stood on that mountain, God gripped my heart, flooded my mind with two resounding words. Wake up. Wake up and realize that there are infinitely more important things in your life than football and a 401k. Wake up and realize there are real battles to be fought, so so different from the superficial, meaningless battles you focus on. Wake up to the countless multitudes who are currently determined for a Christless eternity. He goes on to say, this is all on the eve of becoming the pastor of a mega church, large church. He goes on to say he picked up a Christian periodical. I remember I was preparing preparing to take my first trip to Sudan in 2004. I received a Christian news publication in the mail. The front had two headlines side by side. 
I'm not sure if the editor planned for that particular headline to be next to each other if he just missed it in a really bad way. On the left of the headline, it read, First Baptist Church Celebrates $23 Million Building. A lengthy article followed, celebrating the church's expansive new sanctuary. The exquisite marble, the intricate design, and beautiful stained glass were all described in vivid detail. On the right was a much smaller article. The headline for it read, Baptist Relief Helps Sudanese Refugees. Knowing I was about to go to Sudan, my attention was drawn. The article described 350,000 refugees in western Sudan who were dying of malnutrition and might not live to the end of the year. It briefly explained their plight and suffering. The last sentence said, the Baptists had sent money to help relieve the suffering of the Sudanese. I was excited until I got to the amount. Now remember what was on the left. First Baptist Church celebrates new $23 million building. On the right, the article said, Baptists have raised $5,000 to send to refugees in western Sudan. He goes on to say, that is not enough to get a plane into Sudan, much less one drop of water to people who need it. $23 million for an elaborate sanctuary and $5,000 for hundreds of thousands of starving men, women, and children, most of whom were dying apart from faith in Christ. And then he asked this, where have we gone wrong? I want to tell you this man writing his book, Radical, the subtitle is, Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream. This man has a prophetic voice. He has not yet discovered that there's a covenant call to know God intimately and to declare it to the world by setting aside the seventh day. But this man has a prophetic voice and he's calling to us saying, you know what? The American dream is not the dream Christ had in mind for you. And I don't know when the Sabbath truth will settle squarely onto his, his theological understanding or his spiritual conscience, but I know this. There are men and women out there who are earnestly looking for something better and they're going for it with what they've got. But they're waiting, friends, because there's more to receive and it needs to come from a collective as well as an individual, beautiful, unified, sweet, true, and unembarrassed voice of a Seventh-day Adventist declaring that not a one of those commandments was done away with, especially the one that says, Remember. You see, the American dream has stolen away much from the Christian church, and some in Christianity are waking up. But I fear this morning there are many Seventh-day Adventists who have been educated in fine Seventh-day Adventist educational institutions, and the American dream has stolen our vitality, captured our focus, and killed our love of Jesus. Pretty dire, Pastor. Well, it's pretty serious, friends. Take your Bibles, if you would, and open them up to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 3. I want to go to the very first chapters of this Old Testament prophet, who, by the way, prophesied in Babylon. He was in that second round of capturees that Nebuchadnezzar took back when in about nine years after his first encounter where he took Daniel, he came back. And he took away all the tradesmen and the skilled craftsmen, and he took Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet in exile. And you know, from the very beginning, God wanted him to understand something. He was in Babylon, not Judah. He was in Babylon, not Jerusalem. And this is the message God gives to him in the beginning of his ministry. Son of man, verse 17. I've appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But, but his blood I will require at your hands. 
Turn over to chapter 33. He must have needed a reminder because a sizable way through the book, he's recording similar sentiments. Ezekiel chapter 33. We'll start with the very first verses. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, if I bring a sword upon a land and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman and he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people, then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken warning, he would have delivered his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and a sword comes and takes a person from them, he's taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Now as for you, son of man, I've appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth and give them a warning from me. And when I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. Let's go a little farther. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn away from his ways and he does not turn from his ways, he'll die in his iniquity, but you've delivered your life. Listen, friends, all of these prophecies have not been delivered from, uh, to us by the, the outpouring of the Spirit on godly men and women who study these things. It's not just that we know that the commandments all ought to be kept, especially the encounter with God. It's not just enough that we've seen a manifestation of the gift Paul said to really seek after, which is the gift of prophecy. It's the fact that these prophecies have been opened up to us so that we could have a sense about when the midnight hour is approaching, and yet it appears that we think no one is interested in America. And yet night by night, we probably had anywhere... Our average was 300 in attendance in this site. We were more than one night up over 1,000 people watching online. And we probably had two dozen people here for whom this was either a coming back moment for Christ or a new understanding on a journey. I'm going to tell you why they were here. They were here because over a period of weeks and days, people were on their knees praying, whether it was in their homes or whether it was in this house. We had two people come on the next and the night, last night of this seminar from this community, and on the very same night, both of them not having been here before, mentioned to our pastoral staff how surprised they were at how many people were here. Why? Why be surprised at how many people were here? Flip a coin. Do I go to the meetings tonight? Heads I win, tails you lose. I wonder if God is wanting the trumpet to have a certain sound right now. I wonder if the world should know, your kids, your coworkers, your parents, your friends, your neighbors, why every night for the last 12 nights have you been gone? Don't you have anything to do in the evenings? If the trumpet is supposed to give a sound, but nobody is blowing the trumpet, I want to know how anybody's going to know the sword is on the horizon. That's what Ezekiel said. We've gotten so comfortable, and we've experienced so many blessings. And by the way, friends, yes, indeed, I'm saying some pretty strong things right now, but I could not be much happier about how this last 12 nights have gone. I need you to know every day I'm just on my knees or walking this parking lot saying, Lord, send the people, send the people. And so every night when I came out and sat down over here, I'm, I'm just, how discouraging it is for a pastor to get up and preach to a less than half-filled house, how encouraging it has been for me night by night to get out there and feel and to sense that it matters to a lot of people, the spirits at work and the place is more full than probably it's ever been for a prophetic 
series while I've been here. Some of you watched on home. Some of you watched while you were working. But friends, I need you to know something. We're going to have to go back to watching because pretty soon there's going to be a cloud half the size of a man's hand in the eastern sky. It's going to start as a little dark cloud. And as it comes, it's going to get brighter and brighter. But you know what? This American dream is in the way. And if we don't live our lives that are distinctly different, if the trumpet can't give a certain sound, if the spirit of prophecy cannot redirect and recalibrate our lives, then we end up being the silent generation when the trumpet needs to be sounding with the greatest significance. So we saw on the screen a night or two ago how the devil's going to work with a greater number of temptations and a greater intensity of distractions. But friends, it's time to start letting those things go. If Platt can say in his book that, I mean, they started having what they called secret church meetings in his mega church. How do you have a secret church meeting in a mega church? Well, in their church on a Friday night, you just say, this is going to be a secret church meeting. And just the only thing you can come with is your Bible. And he said pretty soon they had a thousand people every Friday night. They'd get there at a decent time in the evening. He said it was supposed to end by midnight, but he said it just kept going on past midnight. Doctors selling their homes and going to practice in places where doctors won't go. Businessmen directing their resources to the knowledge of the exposition and the giving away of the invitation of mercy in Christ. I mean, this is a Baptist megachurch that made the journey with their pastor like we're trying to make the journey here and like our whole denomination has to come back to being a movement, making a journey with a message about a God you could actually love. Yes, friends, there is a chance that we might not only not fit the criterion of embracing the spirit of prophecy, but we might find ourselves so disadvantaged that we would actually have blood on our hands for all the souls for whom God sent us talents of money, time, treasure, and unity to proclaim to a world, to get the message out. They may not accept it right when we give it. They may not even come into our house to watch it. They might watch it online. But you know what? If God says, blow the trumpet, and we don't blow it, then there is blood on our hands. Mercy is right. Mercy. Now, I didn't call you all here today. God didn't call you all here today. After 12 nights, 14 different messages, 16 times of preaching for the preacher, I didn't call you all here today to discourage you. <laughs> God never leaves us in a place where He wants us to have no knowledge of which way to go. But I do want to say something, especially for every parent or pastor or teacher that is listening to me here today. There is a sword on the horizon. When I stood up on night number three and I told you that our democracies, along with the democracy in Great Britain, are in a political crisis, but in the background, there's a new player rising who's using the words honesty, responsibility, and courage. Three and a half minute video, he uses those words multiple times. And he's calling everybody on May 14, 2020, it's not that far away to Rome, for a re-education moment about how civilization is going to have to work. The global dynamics of re-education, the announcement is out. There is a sword on the horizon. The American dream is short-lived. And it's not for your kids, and it may not even be for you. Good thing there's a heavenly dream, amen? But God is calling us. He's looking to reconstitute. I hold in my hands here this morning a book called Peculiar Speech. It's written again by, I believe, a Baptist pastor who happens to be a church ministries professor at Duke University. He starts out his book. It's a book on preaching. It's called Peculiar Speech. He says the preacher is the one who in the service of the church strikes the rock and brings forth water in dry places. He quotes Walter Brueggemann. He says... When the preacher is uncertain about speech, a great deal of energy is expended reassuring the listener that nothing will be said that would require conversion in order to be understood. Certainly that would be regarded by cultural despisers as foolish or weak. 
By the time most of us finish qualifying the scandal of Christian speech, very little can be said by the preacher that can't be heard elsewhere. Let me interpret what he just said. When a preacher gets up and he doesn't preach with the trumpet and it doesn't give a certain sound and he's assuring everybody it's going to be okay. You don't need to be converted to understand what I'm saying. You don't be, need to be converted to do anything different after I've done talking here. He said you could hear about you could hear what that preacher is saying in just about any place. But gospel preaching is peculiar speech. I'm talking to the preachers for just a minute. Brugman will say, if you're afraid as a preacher, he says, that's okay. Just get down and hunker down behind the text and make sure the people know it's not your message. It came out of the Bible. It's God's. Don't be afraid. But I'm here to tell you today, pastors are living in a very insecure environment. All they need is for, an inse- for a significant member or two to go out and say, you know, I-, I brought my friend to church and you embarrassed me. I brought my friend to church and they didn't feel comfortable. I want you to know that this covenant community we have and this covenant communication, it's a prophetic moment. And there are going to be times when it has comfort and consolation, but there are also going to be times when it has exhortation and edification, which is teaching in righteousness. It's the building up through truth. Those things have the power to make people feel uncomfortable. Last night, I mentioned that I had been in a mosque yesterday. It was an interesting experience. I appreciated so much the teacher and the, their pastor, which they call an imam, spent any time with us afterwards to explain it. I came away from that experience knowing that it's going to be very, very difficult to reach the 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. You want to know some of the reasons why it's going to be hard to reach them? Number one, they are exceptionally devoted to what they understand truth to be. Those men are called five times a day to prayer. I watched about 150 men listen to a sermon and then I watched them multiple times put their face right down on the ground in their prayer service. They take their shoes off when they come into church. Reverence is a huge deal to the Islamic faith. Interestingly, judgment is a big deal as well, which we share that common understanding as we preach our prophetic messages. But let me give you just one little illustration. They don't have music in their worship service, and we wanted to know why. You think for a minute, why no music in an Islamic worship service? Last night, we had four Islamic uh, young women here, sitting right up here in our seminar. I don't know how many Islamic people might be watching online. Why no music? Because they understand the corruptibility of music. So last night when we sat in this room with them over here, we talked a little bit about it. And I explained to them that as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand that music can be used to do great harm and twist and ruin the experience, the spiritual experience of our people. But that music with holy principles and built on holy precepts can do much good to raise the soul up in worship. You know, friends, these books right here, they talk about that. We're not going to win the Muslims very easily because they believe very distinctly in modesty. And while we might not ever come to the expression of modesty that they embrace, it might be that some of our absence of an application of the principles of holiness and how we dress will just be a plain old offense right from the very beginning. And they're going to want to know, how come your people aren't modest? 
Now, I know somebody can get a hold of what I'm saying right now and twist it all over the board. What I'm really trying to say to you is that when the prophetic voice is operative, the distance between us and those who not, do not yet understand the glory of what we share is lessened. The chasm to be crossed is bridged when the principles of holiness are operative in our movement. But that's a function of the prophetic voice. That's a function of us hearing a call to holiness and not rebuffing the rebuke that comes from heaven. Take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Acts, chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Paul had not lost the message of Ezekiel in his pastoral ministry. Acts chapter 20. He's leaving the Ephesus church. I want to begin with verse 25. It says, Now behold, Acts chapter 20. Behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. This is his last time. I won't be back to preach to you anymore. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Why? Because I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he's purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Why did Jesus make it hard to follow him? Why did he say to the man who had a, a father who had just died, let the dead bury their dead? Why did he say to the man who wanted to go back and say goodbye to his family, anybody who turns back is not worthy of following after me? Why did Jesus say, count the cost? Why did Jesus tell the rich young ruler, Sell all that you have. Come and follow me. Why did Jesus do all of these things? Because he understood that the human soul, the sinful nature, wrongly attached to the things of this world, will be drawn back down as the Spirit's trying to lift him up. And Jesus wanted us to count the cost and determine that he was the pearl of great price and he was the treasure worth trading everything in on. You see, friends, the Seventh-day Adventist church is indeed besieged by the world. Materialism is not something we've received an immunity from. The love of pleasure is not something we've received an immunity from. The love of ease is not something we've received an immunity from. Fear and self-preservation and storing up all kinds of assurances for ourselves is not something that we've received an immunity from. We are living at a moment in time where things that we said, even in my lifetime, would come true, are starting to come true. We've preached that the deadly wound would be healed, and we say the pact between Gaspari and Mussolini was a part of it, and it was. We preach the healing of the deadly wound and we say an ambassadorship to the Vatican is part of the healing. And it was. We say that Reagan and the Pope working together to bring down communism shows how the geopolitical ambitions of the papal see are, are being achieved and they are. And now here we are on the brink of a world re-education moment within six months from now with the words courage, responsibility, and honesty being thrown out in the absence of it in the political arenas of men. We see a culture that without Christianity can't govern itself. 
Individuals without the restraining spirit of the spirit can't restrain themselves. Should we be surprised that collectively something like democracy is in a crisis moment when people can't trust each other? Oh, yes. And what are we going to do about it? It's time to double down. It's time maybe to turn things upside down like the house on David Platt's book, Radical. It's time to say, Maybe the American dream isn't to be our dream. Maybe $23 million for the new Baptist megachurch and $5,000 for the 350 Sudanese refugees is a little off. Maybe the things that matter to us, Christ is calling to us to put on the altar. I was driving home this week to get ready for one of the meetings and I heard something very good on our radio station. It was a man and he was, it was a dialogue. He was talking about a discussion they had and the man said, you know, when I sense that the dragon of materialism is out to get me. He said, I get out my sword and I fight back. Now this morning, Nathan Green was kind enough to loan me the sword he puts in the hand of his angels. It's real. It's heavy. I've got two others I could choose from that are Roman. But I want one like David had when he said to the priest there, at Nob. They said, we've got Goliath's sword. He said, that's the one I want. And they went and got it out. He said, when I sense materialism is coming after me, he said, that's when I get out my sword and I fight back. So what's his sword? He said, that's when I get out. Now, it could be a lot of things, but this is how it went off on our radio station. He said, that's when I get out my checkbook. I'm here to tell you, friends, there's going to be blood on the hands of the remnant one way or the other. Oh, yeah. Here's how it's going to work. Either we're going to abdicate the precious prophetic role we've been given in proclaiming the message to a lost world, and we're going to lead the way. Not David Platt in his book, Radical. Oh, I'm glad to lead with him. But you know what? He knows a fraction about the truth in the prophetic book of Revelation. That's what even you know. We're going to lead the way because there's either going to be blood on our hands because we didn't announce that the sword was on the horizon. When Ezekiel, when God says, you see the sword on the horizon and you don't say anything, I'm going to account for that person's blood on your hands. Oh, yes. For some Adventists, there's going to be blood on their hands because they didn't care. And they didn't follow and they didn't obey. But there's going to be blood on others' hands. I want blood on my hands. And I'm going to tell you the kind of blood I want on my hands. Because when Paul is using the narrative of the trumpet giving the certain sound, it's in the context of war. And I'm going to war. And I'm not going to let that dragon get a hold of me without a fight. And I'm not letting my kids, and I'm not letting my friends, and I'm not letting my parents, and I'm not letting my church be taken down by the dragon. So I'm going to get out the sword, and I'm going to swing it. And there's going to be some blood on my hands. And it'll be the blood of the dragon. And while I can't kill him, that's up to Jesus. I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to take back prisoners of hope. And I'm going to deliver people who stuck in bondage and sin. And I'm going to declare by the sword that comes out of the mouth of Jesus, which is the word of God. And I'm going to declare with all the tools he's given me. It's not just my checkbook. It's my schedule. It's my time. It's my talents. And I'm going to swing this sword. When Jesus comes, he's got a sword on his side. You know that, don't you? He's coming as a mighty conqueror. But you know what? The sword is really this. That's what, that's what Paul said. If the trumpet doesn't give a certain sound, because I don't need to swing a literal sword. 
Oh yeah, my, my, my pen's going to write on my checkbook. I don't need to swing a literal sword. But if the trumpet doesn't give a certain sound, how are people going to know where the winning side is versus the losing side? How are they going to know? You see, Jesus... He's going to come with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. But you know what? I'm planning to use my voice and my checkbook and my talent and my time because I'm going to have blood on my hands. It's just not going to be the blood of doing nothing in a crisis. So friends, we're Seventh-day Adventists. Amen? No blood on our hands. I'm so proud of this church, but we still got a ways to go. I'm not here to rebuke you today. I'm here to call you to fidelity. I'm here to call you to be unafraid of exercising the prophetic voice. I thought about it. I was raised by a prophetess. Oh, yes. She's not yet come into the fullness of her spiritual gifts. But my spiritual gift came through my mother. And she taught me right and wrong. And she, she corrected me when I was wrong. And she comforted me when I needed it. We need parents that are exercising the prophetic voice. We need teachers exercising the prophetic voice. Teach them what's right, correct them when they're wrong, and comfort them when they're trying to fix it. Oh yes, friends, this world is sick and in trouble. Somebody's going to have to get blood on their hands. There's going to be a shaking. Thousands of Adventists are going to go out while tr whole families and tribes of earnest truth seekers are going to come in. I'm going to stay with the message by God's grace, and I'm going to give the trumpet a certain sound. What about you? Please stand for the closing song. And loud let it ring, Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing, Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. Echo it, hilltops, proclaim it, ye plains. Jesus is coming again. Coming in glory, the Lamb that was slain. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Tell the vast wandering throng, Jesus is coming again. Tempest and whirlwinds, the anthem prolongs, Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. Nations are angry, by this we do know, Jesus is coming again. Knowledge increases, men run to and fro, Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming. Lord, we've sung that song so many times, thinking it was nation against nation. But now, Lord, we see a house divided against itself. The anger is internalized in nations. Polarization and one side hating another. I'm praying, Lord, bring us back to an attentiveness, a joy of togetherness. Lord, you made us stronger as we went through the 12 nights, not weaker. We expected the... the 
census, the, the population of those attending to drop off, but it, it stayed steady, Lord, and it was more than we've ever had, and we took courage from each other and from the message, your message. I'm praying, Lord, forgive us when we've not done what we should. Forgive us when our hopes and, our, and the efforts and the essence of our life has been too rooted in our own selves. I'm praying, Lord, for all those millions and millions that have never, ever heard that they don't have to offer incense and, and food offerings on top of high mountains or in little temples. I've been there, Lord. I, I, I've gone by those Hindu temples and seen the food that some human beings should have been eating, but instead it was offered up to a God, which is no God at all. Lord, touch our young people, touch our parents, touch their grandparents, touch us all. Maybe we recommit it and find new joy in the unity that comes as we come back to the message and the movement. This is my prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.